Hello, and welcome to a special, special episode of Seize the GM, where we had an interview with a comic creator that is done by the gentleman who runs my local comic shop. I told you guys this episode was coming, and here it is. So without further ado, let's give it up for these two. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Bill Langford. I'm Sean Parson. Uh We're here um, talking about uh, a brand new project that's in the works. Uh, Sean is a local artist and creator, uh, comic book writer. Uh, anything you want to add? Rock and tour. Um, Rock and tour. Yeah. I should put that on cards. Uh, Man about town. You spell that R A K C R A C O N. It's like ranking yeah. bass. Ranking it. Ranking tour. Yeah. Um, but uh, Sean, I guess you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, um, your uh, your background, and okay. Um, well, uh, I'm a comic book artist. But I've been working in comic books for the about the last ten, moving into eleven years. Uh, I usually do a book called the Dungeon Comic, which I call the most epic comic ever. Oh, it's, it's the most. It's the biggest. Uh, if I put it all in a graphic novel, mm-hmm. it'll be the largest graphic novel ever done by one person. Somebody contact Guinness. And, uh, you know, some people brought, like I was on a show a while back and somebody brought up Bone, but Bone mm-hmm. is not done just by Jeff Smith. You know, okay. but like there's a, that, so I always specify, like, there is nobody else doing anything but me. I do the colors, the letters, the art, the writing, um, which is a big task. Right. And, and how long have you been working on the dungeon? Physically working on the book the last 10 or 11 years, but that started about 20 years ago. In your head. In my head. Wow. Yeah. There's actually artwork from back then. Seriously? Yeah. Like the, uh, Stuff you sketched out, character designs? They, they, it started as an idea, and I wanted to make a movie of it, and I was taking uh, art classes um, at the University of Tennessee, mm-hmm. and uh, I took a watercolor class, and we could just do really whatever we wanted to. Because I was, I was a painting major, so you kind of had just carte blanche of what you want to do. Nice. And I thought, well, I'll make um, storyboards yes. for this movie. And the storyboards turned into these very large, very large, uh, like watercolor comic book pages. Do you remember what the name of the movie was? It was it was Dungeon. Okay. Yeah, it was okay. before I added the comic. Okay. To it. But yeah, it was the Dungeon, and a lot of that, st- which I still have those. Yeah. A lot of those were the seeds of what spun off the Dungeon, and it grew much bigger than that. Right. But right. yeah. So how many total pages? Where are you at now on the Dungeon? If you were doing a page count. I think I'm um, almost 700. Oh, I think if I hit the 700, I'll hit the I'll hit the mark. So you yeah. you you penciled, ink, colored, and written. <clears throat> yeah. 700 pages. Yes. So that is pretty impressive when like, you put it in context like that. Like people, you know, I mean, it's like a singer songwriter, somebody that does. You know, you do every component. You know, you write the song, you create the music, uh, you do the album art. Yeah. You uh, you pay off the DJ at the local station. It it's you know. It's not feasible to do that economically like what I'm doing because it's so time consuming. Okay. And, you know, whereas my new book that I'm doing is so different than the dungeon in the, my in my attack of it. Mm-hmm. The dungeon is, you know, this kind of fantasy horror epic. So there's there's panels upon panels. There's pages. There's, you know, 40, 50 pages of them fighting zombies or werewolves or monsters. Yeah. And it's not fighting one. There's I'm sold. There's tons. Yes. So to draw all those people, to draw it, to ink all those people, to color, and you know, and when I color the dungeon versus my new book transfer, it's a totally different process because I, I literally kind of digitally paint the dungeon, whereas on transfer, it's really kind of supposed to look like an old '80s comic. Mm-hmm. It, it's colored very simple, and then I half tone it so it has the the dot patterns, and then uh, the pages actually look like they're newsprint. I've Ooh. even kind of yellowed them. Nice. That's so, a, yeah. but but that was kind of economic too. Like, how can I make this look like a, a cartoon or like a '80s comic? Do this very economically, very quick. So, this new project you mentioned, transferred. Uh, the name sounds interesting. Uh, I, I'm just curious. Uh, what, what would you, how would you describe this book? Transferred is a story about a 12 year old girl named Jamie Lane. 45 words or less. And. Uh, 
<laughs> I'm just kidding. Go ahead. I'll give you nine. Uh, uh, she's a 12-year-old girl named Jane Ling mm-hmm. that uh, chases monsters and solves mysteries with her pet pitbull Jones. Okay. And I describe it as it's like Scooby-Doo meets Nancy Drew if Nancy Drew were a 12-year-old transgender girl. That's where I usually get a pause from people. Oh, that wasn't a pause. That was just how I was looking at my notes with my pausing. Uh, so uh, Scooby-Doo meets Nancy Drew. Um, now, didn't you say... God, Correct me if I'm wrong. Did you say there was a tagline uh, for the that you had for the book? There was, but I kind of got some backlash on it. But people, can but you, people really. Can, can you tell us the tagline? The, the tagline originally. You can't leave it out. And I, I removed it mm-hmm. because I didn't want to be insensitive or hurtful to people. Okay. But a lot of people liked it, yeah. and it was uh, there's no greater friendship than a girl and his dog. See, I, I, I think that's kind of sweet. Now maybe it's because I'm a dog person. But you know, I have to explain this. Okay. Uh, on on transfer for a second because transfer grew more than uh, as a lot of things do once you start working and thinking about things. Is that some transgender people explain to me that they are very hurt because of the mixing of the pronouns? Yeah, it's a very sensitive subject and, right now. And I didn't mean it that way. Right. But one of the things that I'm trying to do is not divide people but kind of make people more accepting sure and the people that may not be as tra- what i call trans friendly mm-hmm. like it it attracts those people in they're like oh that's kind of cute that's kind of funny like i want to i want to read that and so when i the way i designed the book and the story was that it's not full of trigger words there's no sjw's there's no trump things there's no you know, this and that, there's no bathroom deals. It's just like, this is a story about a little girl that solves mysteries right. with a pet pit bull. Um, does it, does it address that, you know, uh, when she goes home that she takes her clothes off and she's, you know, a little boy? Yes. But it's like, I'm really trying to make it my, my goal is that people that aren't that accepting of it, that they'll get so wrapped up in liking her that in time that that acceptance will be like well you know what that's actually like a nice little story that's a that's a cool little character so would you say one of your goals in this project is maybe to educate some people possibly about acceptance of i would say or do you think if someone reads this that they will come away with that feeling i that's my hope my hope isn't like and there were things that i've learned just in because i really knew nothing I mean, I was really fish out of water. Like, I didn't know that the tagline I made was bothersome. Right. You know, um, just things that I've learned about how to approach things and how to do things that makes it very difficult as a writer. Because one of the things that I've always been, that I always felt that I was good at was writing comedy, which is not easy, is that it's hard to write comedy and not offend somebody. And not even trying to be offensive, but somebody's always going to take offense to something. Mm -hmm. So... My goal was to not, you know, badger people or kind of throw political things over their head or force things down the throat. Like, I often um, use uh, different strokes as an example, like the old TV show. The old TV show, like the people that that are too young to remember, like, it it was so avant-garde to have this white, rich man that had adopted two Mr. Drummond. But every episode was not about... That they're black kids, they were just his kids. Right. And obviously it was there because you saw it. Sure. You know, but for people our age and our generation, I think that helped, especially if you didn't grow up with a lot of black people around, I think that helped the acceptance of like, hey, there are people too. There, there's nothing wrong with that. that. That's okay. So your book is The Different Strokes of Comics. It is The so. Different Strokes of Comics with Transgender People. Um, which I, I, you know, I, it, it sounds intriguing and I, it definitely sounds like something I want to read. Um, would you say, so I know you said one of your inspirations was 80 more, 80, 1980s Saturday morning cartoons. Yes. That's a wonderful inspiration. Um, comic book wise, what would you say some of your big inspirations are? My biggest inspiration, uh, mm-hmm. when I was a kid had to be, uh, Amazing Spider-Man, especially with, uh, Todd McFarlane. Okay. You know, oh, of course. When, when I was about 11, uh, my grandpa gave me a subscription mm-hmm. And I think he came in about four or five issues into it. Uh-huh. And I remember just like being blown away by this artwork and art style, as many people were. Oh, yeah, it was know. very popular. Um, I very much, I think that's like, I remember somebody asking me one time, Can you teach my kid how to draw like you do? And I said, No. Yeah. And they said, Why? And I said, Well, because I can't teach them 
to be to have the motivation to sit down uh-huh. and, and want to. Like I can teach you how to do things. I can show you how to go about doing things. But there were so many hours for, for me being 11, 12, 13, 14, to sit there and look at Todd McFarlane pages. And, and some people would say, well, the anatomy is not correct. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's bad things with it. Uh-huh. But to sit there and like literally take a sheet of notebook paper and trace, not to just try to pull some sort of fraud off, but learn how it moves. To like, this is the shape. I remember learning the shape of his forearms, uh-huh. how his hands bend. How how he drew a mouth, and you know, and at one point I, I probably can't do this anymore. But at one point, you know, if you said draw an arm like Todd McFarlane, I could draw an arm like Todd McFarlane. Like I was very much Todd McFarlane, yeah. you know. And as I grew, as I as I grew more and more, and I looked at other things, um, even if you go back and look at the dungeon over ten years, like the way that I drew, you know, Lacey in the very beginning was not how I draw it today. Right, and, yeah. the, and I'm assuming the art style you use in transfer is different from the art style. It is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There, it's a very different, because it, it's supposed to look like an 80s car, very simplified. Right, yeah. and and whereas the dungeon um, was more of a adult uh, I'd say it's an R-rated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I wouldn't go as far to say X, because it, it does not go in that realm, but it is no. definitely an R-rated. Um, it's an, I always say it's an exploitation. It, it's like 70s, and, and it's not necessarily... You know, and there's different versions of that, but like, you know, you could sit there and say, it, you know, uh, Fast and Furious is an exploitation film. You know, Terminator is an exploitation film. Star Wars is an exploitation All wonderful film. films. Yeah, all, uh, yeah, Robocop's an exploitation Love film. Love Robocop. Um, you know, and then stuff like Hard Bodies or Ilsa She Wolf of the Essence. Those yes. are all exploitation films. But transferred, you would regard more as all ages. It is, yeah. It's very much, there's, like, I consciously have not made the language like uh whereas in the dungeon you know my character fire would be very potty mouth mm-hmm. you know um you know Janie, you know her uh her dirty words are like holy mac and cheese or I like stuff. it like like very yeah. it's very much geared for children to be able to read it. that 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 is that is intentional and what was it that initially drew you i mean were you just thinking hey i i want to draw uh, and create a transgender project or was it something creatively that just led you to that or was it just happenstance or it was not intentional okay but like completely unintentional uh, because you were doing a strip correct me if I'm wrong weren't you doing a strip that was about a high school uh, was it a principal or a teacher I did, before the dungeon well in between the beginning of the city of the dungeon mm-hmm. and the actual dungeon comic I did a web comic that I tried to get syndicated for about a year and a half that was about a middle school Yes. And that, again, was another style that morphed into the dungeon. Um, um, but uh, what happened with uh, Transferred was that when I was doing the dungeon, there were these parody ads. And I was looking for something to fill space, because sometimes when you paste things out, you, you have a space that you need to fill. So in that, uh, what I did was uh, I thought about I think it was, I think that this was right when they had removed Saturday morning cartoons. Yes. From the lineup. Yes, I remember that. And I thought, you know, I remember as a kid being so excited, and, and I think we grew up in a really great time that those cartoons were so great because we saw so many original things. That. What was your favorite Saturday morning cartoon back then? I'm just curious. My two favorite ones are my number one is Spider Man's Amazing Friend. I love it. And the second was Thunder the Barbarian. Both of them. You know, Absolutely. Just, just uh, my third one was probably Dungeons and Dragons. Okay. And um, I was thinking about those, and I was thinking mm-hmm. about how they would put the ads in the comics, which usually weren't very good. That the ads. Right. Um, and so I thought I'm going to make an ad of what would go on. If, this is really geared towards the dungeon world of what would be in the future. Like, what what cartoons if they hadn't pulled them off Saturday morning? And they were still on the air 10 years from now. Mm-hmm. What would they put on there? So I was really trying to think of things that you would not see Back in, the 80s. in the 80s. And some of them were like, you brought up uh, my Held Back comic strip that I did. Mm-hmm. I thought, well, I got that one. That'll be Saturday morning cartoon. I created one called The Plumber Dogs. It's just cartoon animals. They're plumbers. It's called Plum Studio. Yeah. You know. uh, yeah. I mean, it's just stuff that was like a wink to 80s stuff. And as I was creating them, one of the ones that I created was transferred. And I drew this pit bull, 
and I drew this little girl, and I thought, you know, something that we would have never seen in the 80s is this transgender. Like, that would have absolutely, it would have never made air if it did. It probably would have been lobbied to be removed. It would have been, right. And I thought, what if this was absolutely geared towards kids? And it was really one little square to fill up this time slot on that Saturday morning ad. I see. And so I started showing the ad mm-hmm. to people or, or the that issue to people, and people were like, I would, I would watch this cartoon. And that kind of surprised me because sometimes your best ideas are stuff that you. That's right. You just you toss this, to the this side. And, and so when I there was no uh, there was no thing of like, oh I've got this idea about like this was literally if, of all the ones on that lineup. If you mm-hmm. said you can go pitch Cartoon Network today, mm-hmm. I probably wouldn't have even packed a, a thing for that. And for transferred, you have a Kickstarter coming up. I do. That you're trying to it starts March 12th, and you're trying to get funding. And so, it, explain to me. I'm just curious. I, I've never thought of it from this standpoint. What I mean, what's involved money wise with, with making a comic, publishing a comic, uh, distributing a comic, marketing okay. the whole nine yards uh, in, in 45 words or less. <laughs> well, the thing with Kickstarter is, or why people go to it, is that for me to order uh, books to be printed, right? The book's already done. I need to be printed. So you have to find the sweet spot that you can order the right amount to where the price point of the book is, you know, reasonable that you can sell it. So how many books are we talking about? Like, what are you looking right at? now? Uh, depending, if I just hit its goal, we're looking at a thousand books. A thousand but books. a thousand books, and this is where the math gets into it. You uh-huh. know, to do that, you know, I have to have because it, it's popular on Kickstarter. I have to have variant cover. So to get a variant cover out of those, I don't get any more than a thousand books, but my price goes up. Right. So, you know that I can't remember what it was that we're looking at something like seventeen hundred dollars for a thousand issues with two covers. Then I have to have packages to ship it in. That's right. those aren't free. Right. I have to pay for postage to ship it. There's some legal fees that I have to pay for. You know, you pay for trademarks and, and such. There's fees I have to pay at Kickstarter. There's fees I have to pay the IRS. Um, I'm offering magnets and stickers and prints. All those I have to pay for, too. So all that you have to kind of factor in and say, you know, I, my goal right now, unless it changes between now and launch, is $3,500. Oh. And the $3,500 is this. As, and if it hits the goal, I mean, I'm not going to pocket $500. I'm not pocketing $1,000. I'm just getting stuff to where I can go take it out and sell it and hope. And that's the other misnomer that sometimes people do, like when they scam artists, like they'll be a writer and say, oh, I'll give you some of the books. I won't pay you, but I'll give you some of the books. Well, let's say they get 100 books. Right. And the books, they can they, they can sell for $4. Yes. Well, if they go sit up at a show, they may spend two to three, $400 for the table, and they're not going to sell 100 books at that one show. So it sounds like there's, there's a giant leap of faith doing this kind of thing. Very, very much. You're putting out an initial outlay of cost, a huge amount of money. There's no guarantee that's going to come back. And there's if you no do sell them all, you're going to sell through. Which I sold out dungeon books, but it, I didn't sell them out in one day. So you published eight dungeon books so far? Eight? So far nine? in the dungeon, there's eight. There's the last two should turned into like five. Okay. And how did you do with the sell through on those? I mean, did those you do- I sold out. Okay. I sold out the issues. But again, I didn't sell out overnight. If it I sold out overnight, it'd be a different story. It took you know, a it, year. Yeah, I mean, you're literally selling them out of the trunk, going to shows, you know, selling them on the internet. So. Man, that sounds awesome. You just travel to shows. It's out of your trunk. trunk. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that sounds incredible. I did get to see a lot of the country. I, I got oh, yeah. to sell a lot, a lot of these things. Oh, I'm sure you have a ton of stories. Yeah. Um, and so <clears throat> your Kickstarter goes live Tuesday. Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern time. 10 a.m. Eastern time. Yeah. And if I was looking to find that, how would I find that on Kickstarter? Do I just go? I, yes. or do I just kinda... if, if you go into Kickstarter, there is a, you can do it two ways. Is there a search engine or something on Kickstarter? There, there is. There's a search thing. You go into Kickstarter. It's just kickstarter.com. Mm-hmm. You can search transferred. Mm-hmm. Now, you can't see it yet because it's not live. But the moment it becomes live, okay. it'll pop up. Or you can go to comics. If you just go to comics, it may be a little take you a little bit longer to find because it's going to be in there with everything else. But you should be able to search transferred and pull it up. Okay. And then, as far as I know, a lot of these Kickstarters, um, it's real trendy now. You know, you give away a beer koozie, uh, a bumper sticker. Uh, there's these plateaus. Is that what they're called? Or, or well, they're, they're reward tiers. Reward tiers. And like 
to uh, because you need to get as many people to donate early because that helps your success. Okay. And so, so what I'm have... doing is the first three days, mm-hmm. the first 50 people that donate in the first three days, is I'm going to give them a special print that's no extra. If they, if they donate $25 or more, right. they'll get an extra print, and I'm going to draw a hit sketch on that print. Oh, about like yeah. a character? So if, a... They, if they donated two weeks into it, they mm-hmm. won't get that print. If they donate that day, they'll get that print. So okay. that, I'm just throwing that in for free, and I'm paying for those prints out of my pocket. Okay. Yeah. So I, I so I definitely want to print. So I need to I need to be on the first day. Is that what we're doing on Tuesday? And it's real cool. It is. Okay. And you've got three days and it looks real cool because it looks like a VHS tape. Oh, VHS tape. It looks like a VHS tape coming what, out of the package. Those, I don't understand. What does that mean? A VHS tape. <laughs> it's, it sounds it, it's like it uh, sounds cool. It's like a pre- tell, tell prehistoric us. video. Okay, okay. It's, it's like uh, it's like the internet when you didn't have the internet on your TV and you plopped a giant box into it. If I was bring these big wheels on it. If I was born back in the sixties or seventies, I would know what this VHS tape is, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. And so this so it's got a, it's got a litho, it's got a cool VHS tape on it. Yes. Um there's head sketches. Head sketch, yeah. There's gonna be stickers. There's, I got stickers, I got magnets, I got so, another I mean, pretty much I got another I mean, there's gonna be, there's gonna be something covers, no matter what, no matter original what art, no matter what I donate. There's a uh, sketch cover. I'm gonna get something coming back. Yes. yes. And we get we get we get an issue of transfer. The big thing is because I have to uh, order it from overseas to be mm. shipped. That takes a while. Everybody that donates five dollars or more gets a PDF. So if you if you buy well, the book, you get a PDF to read. Why you wait on the book? I don't see how you can lose on this. Uh, I really don't. It sounds uh, seriously. It sounds like a winner. So uh, I know where I'm going to be uh, Tuesday morning. Um, Ten a.m. At, well, after I, after well, I was talking about the Waffle House. Eleven a.m. Twelve. <laughs> after I get a, a big bit breakfast. I'm gonna be on uh, Kickstarter looking up transferred in the search engine and, and all comics and and it's a fun book. Yeah, no, it's, I, it's fun. It's not. It's not a downer. It's it's really it's real. It's like it's a really exciting adventure book. Absolutely, Sean. So uh, thanks for showing up here at the comic shop. We Thank appreciate you. uh we appreciate you being here. Thank you for having me. And uh, everybody, Tuesday uh, the twelfth uh, on Kickstarter transferred. Uh, check it out. Thanks. is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License. All copyright and material referenced herein is held by their respective owners. No infringement intended and no claim of ownership is implied. The music for the show is Laser Groove by Kevin McLeod. You can find his work at Incompetech.com and it is released under a Creative Commons 3.0 license.